This evening, in keeping with uh, the tradition at the first of the month, until I get tired of it, we will be looking at one of the Psalms. And in this case, we will be looking at Psalm 8. Um, this is in many ways a very beneficial psalm to study. I realize I say that about every psalm, so it's kind of cliche at this point. But this is the Bible we're talking about, and the Bible is certainly full of great riches and treasures no matter where you turn. Uh, it dawned on me as I was preparing this lesson, uh, Mark recently preached on Hebrews chapter 2 uh, just a few weeks ago, and Hebrews chapter 2 quotes Psalm 8, so there's a little bit of overlap in terms of the ideas that get presented. Um, now, granted, I'm coming at it from the opposite direction. We're going to read the psalm instead of the New Testament passage that quotes it, uh, and maybe move to that from there, whereas Mark starts from the New Testament passage that quotes it and goes back to the psalm. So maybe we'll learn something different looking at it backwards, and if nothing else, it's always helpful to look at the same scripture again. Psalm 8. If we're simply reading the book, and we read the book of Psalms sequentially, this is the first true psalm of praise that we encounter. Now, other psalms have given reasons to praise. Other psalms may have had a statements of praise. But this psalm is the first true psalm of praise. Furthermore, this psalm of praise is unique. Most praise psalms, what do they say? They say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, which is the same thing. It's Hebrew for praise Yahweh. Hallelujah is basically an exhortation to praise the Lord. It's calling on other people to come and praise. But that's not what this psalm is. What this psalm is, is actually is a statement of praise to God. Let's read it. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than God. You crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You will put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now if you read that, You'll notice one of the most prominent features, at least this one jumped out at me right away, is that the psalm begins and ends the same way. It's exactly the same line at the beginning and the end. O Lord, our Lord, really, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I pointed this out a month ago, but I'll point it out again. Not only are the first and last line the same, but the last line of the previous psalm and the first line of the next psalm are actually pretty similar too. Psalm 7 and verse 17 says, I will give thanks to Yahweh according to His righteousness and will sing praise to the name of Yahweh Most High. And Psalm 9 and verses 1 through 2, I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Now there's a lot of uh, argument about whether or not the Psalms are intentionally arranged. This looks like pretty good evidence that there is some kind of structure to the way he's putting them together. Some kind of uh, reasoning that he's using and arranging them. The beginning and ends of these psalms form a frame that fits around Psalm 8. Is that a coincidence or is that an intentional arrangement? Now little things like that suggest that the the, you know, while the, inspired psal the psalms themselves are inspired, they're not being arranged haphazardly either. There's a message behind it. And we may have difficulty figuring out what it is, but we should, I think, not despair of looking for that message. The outline of this psalm, praise. Praise for what? Well, the first two verses are praise for God's glory. And then the next two verses, three and four, are wondering. Wonder at what? Wonder at God's consideration. Wondering why God, in all of His glory, should care about us and consider us and think about us. And verses 5 through 9, 
Or marvel. Marvel at what? Marvel at what God gives man. Marveling at the fact that God is so glorious and has invited man to share in that glory and participate in that glory. These are the feelings we should all have towards God. Praise for God's glory. Wonder at God's consideration. Why would He consider a person like me? Marvel at God's gift. I am amazed that He has done so much for me. I'm fond of pointing this out. The fact that the Psalms share so many connections with the first two things in the book of Psalms, Psalm 1 and 2. There's quite a few, there's a few connections between Psalm 2 and Psalm 8. For instance, in Psalm 2 and verse 7, David writes, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again in verse 12, there is a call for the nations to do homage to the son, or uh, literally kiss the son, so that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. There's a focus on the fact that God appoints his son as king. And in verse 8, it says that he tells the son, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. He appoints this king whom he calls his son, and he gives him dominion over the whole world. Thirdly, I would note in verses 1 through 3 that the nations, they are these adversaries, and we looked at this already this morning, the nations are in an uproar. They're devising a vain thing. They're plotting and conspiring to overthrow the Lord and His anointed one. They're saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. They take their stand against the Lord and against His anointed King. But what does that have to do with Psalm 8? Well, Psalm 8 contains a lot of these same elements. For instance... In Psalm 8, in verse 4, the question is asked, What is man or the son of man that you are mindful of him? God is mindful of the son of man. Secondly, you'll notice in verses 6 through 8, an emphasis on the fact that he rules over the creation. Verse 6, you make him to rule over the work of your hands. You will put all things under his feet. And then he proceeds to list a bunch of animals and things of the created order that have been subjected to his feet. See how that is parallel with the Son, the King that God appoints to rule the ends of the earth. And thirdly, in verse 2, he makes a statement that from the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Those three elements are going on here. God has appointed a Son. That Son rules over the created order. That Son puts an end to the adversaries that are involved. That's going on in Psalm 2 and 8. These connections are likely not a coincidence. But what else is there? There's also parallels with another important chapter in the Bible. A chapter not at the beginning of the Psalms, but at the beginning of the Bible itself. Genesis chapter 1. And it's hard to read Psalm 8 without seeing that he's using a lot of creation language in this psalm. Look at verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is in your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. Where else in the Bible do we see the words heaven and earth used together? I can think of at least one place in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. He's calling to mind, just with those use of those terms, he's calling to mind parallels. He talks in verse 3 about the establishment of the moon and the stars. That's a reference to the fourth day of creation. When the Lord creates the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars also. Genesis 1 verses 14 through 19. He talks about the Son of Man, or... Another way you could translate the word man is Adam. Because the word, man, the word for mankind and the word Adam are the same word, Adam. Uh, you know, so there's an interchangeability that's taking place there. Man rules creation in verse 6. Well, that's the same thing that God told man in Genesis chapter 1 in verses 26 and 29. He said in verse 26, Let 
us make man in our own image according to our likeness and do what? Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And again in verse 29, God said, excuse me, that should be verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. There's also a reference to cattle and beasts. That recalls the sixth day of creation. There's also a reference to birds and fish. That recalls the fifth day of creation. Why does this psalm make so many references to different animals? Because it's using that language of Genesis chapter 1 to get you to think about the creation. That's a big point of the psalm. Getting you to think about the created order and man's place in it. Now, I titled this sermon, Kings of Creation, Kings Over Creation, but the word king doesn't really appear in Psalm 8. So why are we calling this Kings Over Creation? Well, we're going to talk about that as we get a little further in. Let's talk a little bit more about the text first. The praise for God's glory. In the beginning and end, he says, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, most Bibles, including the one I'm reading out of, renders this, O Lord, our Lord. Um, they distinguish between the all caps, Lord, and the lower case, regular case, Lord, um, because those are actually two different words. In the, um, the convention has been for a long time to translate the word Yahweh, the name, God's proper name, as Lord in all caps, while uh, translating the word Adonai, which is their actual word for Lord or Master, as just the word Lord, or in some cases, Master. Now, the reason for this is complicated. The Jews believed that the name of Yahweh was so sacred that it should never be spoken aloud, lest it defile the lips. There was only one occasion where Jewish tradition permitted the name of Yahweh to be spoken aloud. And it was when the high priest entered the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. Now, the name could still be written. You just couldn't say the name. And so anytime they would be reading their Hebrew Bibles and they come to the word Yahweh, they would read Adonai, which is Lord. And the New Testament follows this convention, actually, because every time they quote the Old Testament Scripture, they use the word for Lord, Kyrios. Uh, so, you know, what do you do with that? Um, well, you know, different people have different beliefs about whether you should or should not say the name today. Obviously, since I've said the word Yahweh several times in this sermon, I don't have any problem with it being used. The Scriptures do not teach that there's a problem with using it. That is simply a tradition that people follow. And, you know, perhaps we should be respectful towards tradition, but I'm not going to provide any further commentary on that. God's glory, where is God's glory seen? Well, you can go outside and look up into the heavens, and it's a glorious thing. You look at the sunset, that's a cool thing to look at, right? Is that the only place that God's glory is manifested? Well, no. There's a it's kind of a contrast going on here in verses 1 and 2. God's glory is manifested in the majestic skies and in the tiny infant as well. I can look up into the skies and the heavens and say, wow, God is glorious. And then I should be able to look at my, uh, my four-month-old daughter and say the same thing. Because the Lord made both. The Lord provided both. But what is so amazing about these infants, these children that the psalm talks about, um, you know, it's setting up, of course, the universal expanse versus human insignificance right there. He's setting up for the contrast that takes place later. But these infants, look at what they do. They put a stop to adversaries. If I'm going to go build a fortress, or you're going to set up a strong army, who are the last people in the world that you are going to recruit to fight for you? Infants. I mean, are you going to recruit a four-month-old child, a zero-month-old child to go fight a battle for you? To go fight against your enemies? No! It's absurd! Why would you do that? A crying baby isn't going to be much used against a military oppressor. And yet the Scripture says that God establishes strength from the mouths of infants and nursing children. And furthermore, that that strength is enough to put a stop to the enemies. Well, whose enemies? David's enemies? Our enemies? God 
God's enemies, ultimately. And this is where the connection with Psalm 2 comes in handy. Psalm 2 spoke about the nations conspiring to overthrow the Lord's Christ, to overthrow God's deputy on the earth. They are the adversaries and the enemies. They are the wicked ones that are spoken of throughout the first seven psalms. Those who will not stand in the assembly of the righteous. Those who are oppressing the righteous and punishing them while they get to live in lush security. But they're put a stop to by the simplest and smallest of things in this world. In Matthew chapter 21 and verses 14 through 16, Jesus is in the temple and the children in the temple are shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! And the rulers come to Jesus and they tell Jesus, you're having a bad influence on the children. Make them stop. Do you hear what these children are saying? And what does Jesus do? He quotes this psalm. He says, haven't you heard what it says in the scripture? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. In this case... Who's the real adversary? Well, the Jewish leaders are the adversaries because they oppose the truth. And the children are the ones who put a stop to them and bring silence to them. Wonder at his consideration. If you look at the skies and you look at the moon and you look at the stars and you look at everything that God has created, that leads to a question, a very pressing question. What is man? You know, uh, I've heard this sermon before about you know comparing the uh, the size, trying to figure out the size of the universe, uh, and I mean, you know they didn't have all the astronomical knowledge back then that we have today. I'll tell you something: further study into astronomy only makes this question more poignant. What is man really? You know what? The, how big the universe is? It's so big. I'm not even going to try to undertake that in this lesson because it would take a whole sermon just to explain how big it is. And we can spend a long time talking about how many Earths can fit in the sun, how many suns can fit in the galaxy, how many galaxies can fit in the supercluster, and all that, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, we're not really going to be able to get our heads around how truly immense and crazy huge this universe really is. We are an infinitely small dot on an infinitely small dot on an infinitely small dot on an infinitely small dot. And you know what happens if you take us out of the universe? Probably not much. Unless changes. In the grand scheme of things, that's just compared to the universe. How big is God compared to the universe? Well, the universe becomes the infinitely small dot on the infinitely small dot on the infinitely small dot on the infinitely small dot. God is bigger. <laughs> God made that. He fashioned it with his hands. <clears throat> However infinitely small we are in the universe, the universe is that way and more so to God. And yet in spite... I mean, we're nothing. Compared to the universe, mankind is nothing. Compared to God, the universe is nothing. And yet in spite of man's infinite smallness, God takes notice. God takes notice of him. That's incredible. I gotta ask why. Why does God do that? What possible value does he see in man? What is God getting out of this relationship? Do we have anything to offer God? Well, not last time I checked. Do we have any intrinsic worth? No. Not save the worth that God assigns to us. We don't really deserve any consideration from God. We don't really deserve this. You know, this isn't a sermon about how, oh, look at you, you're so wonderful and you're so special. No, you're not, but the Lord loves you anyway. That's the real impact of this psalm, is that we really aren't that special, but God takes consideration of us anyway. I'm not a great person. But Jesus died for my sins. In spite of the fact that I was a sinner, though no one would hardly die, dare to die for a righteous man. Hardly die for a righteous man. Maybe somebody will dare to die for a good man. But in spite of the fact that I was a sinner and an enemy, Christ died for me so that I could be saved from the wrath of God. That's what's incredible about this, is that the Lord takes notice of us and pays attention to us even though we don't deserve it. Marvel at His gift. Marvel at what He has done. He has made man a little lower than Elohim. What is that? 
then this is where we run into a translation issue. Let's do this by show of hands. How many of your Bibles said God? And he's a little lower than God. How many of your Bibles said, said he's a little lower than the angels? Yeah? How many of your Bibles said he's a little lower than the divine beings or heavenly beings? You're reading the ESV. Uh, you know, that's a God, angels, heavenly beings. That's an interesting question. This word is most frequently translated God, but not without exception. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the word is translated judges, like in reference to human judges. There's a couple places in the law, it's in Exodus, where it's translated that way. Um, you know, it's... Let me ask you a question. Sorry, I should have put heavenly beings up there. Is it God? Are we lower than God, or are we lower than the angels? Well, I think the answer to the question is yes. The Bible affirms both. Both are true. What does the scripture say? Well, Hebrews chapter 2, when it quotes this passage, uses angels. Now, some people have tried to argue that man is not lower than the angels. And, I mean, let's think about that for a second. You know, I mean, we are someday going to judge the angels. 1 Corinthians 6.3 says that. We have privileges in Christ that they do not. We've had the word revealed to us, something into which angels long to look. 1 Peter, 10, 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 12. But I think it's... And I don't think, I think it's reasonable to conclude it's human arrogance to claim that we're now greater than they are. I mean, who here wants to get into a fight with an angel? I don't think I want to do that. Do you? We don't have any authority over the angels. We can't tell them what to do. We can't boss them around. We certainly can't win in a wrestling match with them. Jacob got into a wrestling match with an angel. The text says he prevailed, but that probably doesn't mean that he prevailed in the sense that he won. It means he prevailed in the sense that he didn't die. Angels are a little bit rough to get into conflict with. But here's what's really going on. Is that even though man is made lower, he is crowned anyway. He's crowned with glory and honor. And he's made to rule over the creation. Let's keep looking. God talks about how the works of his hands are placed under man's feet. You've got to love the cool poetic parallel between God's hands and man's feet. There's a catalog in verses 7 through 8 of created animals, and we already noted how that's a throwback to days 5 and 6 of creation, covering all the different categories of the sky and the earth and the sea. And then the song ends the way it began. Uh, which we've already noted. Oh, Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, let's look at Jesus for a minute. What about Jesus? And to look at Jesus' fulfillment of the psalm, we really need to look at Hebrews chapter 2. In verses, starting in verse 5. He quotes it in Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8. He interprets it in verse 9. That he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking, but one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And then he begins to offer his interpretation of that. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one. Now, how does Jesus fulfill this psalm? Because we just looked at the psalm, and the psalm seems pretty clear, is talking about the relationship between man and the rest of creation. But the writer of Hebrews sees Jesus in this psalm. And furthermore, the writer of Hebrews uses this expression, made lower and crowned, to talk about what? Made lower equals the death of Jesus. Crowned refers to the resurrection of Jesus. That's what he's saying in verse 9. Because he was made for a little while lower than the angels because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. 
The phrase, you've made him for a little while lower than the angels, refers to his incarnation and his death. The phrase, you've crowned him with glory and honor, refers to his resurrection and his ascension. What is this psalm, well, what is Hebrews 2 about? You remember Mark talking about it. The basic point of Hebrews chapter 2, in a nutshell, is to answer one very simple question. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? I mean, couldn't God have done it without that part? Well, the answer that is given is that Jesus had to join the creation in order to be our high priest. And if Jesus was truly going to join the creation, He had to die. In verse 16 of Hebrews 2, uh, the translations... Uh, there's a difficulty translating verse 16. Probably a good way to read it is in verse 16 is that death does not take hold of angels, but it does take hold of the seed of Abraham. There's a little bit of an issue about what the subject of the verb is in verse 16. Um, he seems to refer to God, as a lot of Bible versions have, but it could be it in reference to death in verse 15. Assuredly, it, in other words, death, does not take hold of angels, but it does take hold of the descendants of Abraham. In which case, the issue is, Jesus couldn't just become an angel. Because death doesn't take hold of angels. Jesus had to go lower than that. Jesus had to become mortal. Jesus had to join the descendants of Abraham, of whom death has been holding sway. This is what's happened. Jesus had to become part of the creation. He had to be made lower than the angels. He had to die so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. Verse 17 says he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Well, that raises another question. How in the world did we get death, burial, and resurrection out of a psalm that's about the creation? I mean, if the writer of Hebrews had submitted this as a paper to an Old Testament interpretation class, his teacher might have given him a bad grade. Because it doesn't, right away, it doesn't seem to square with the original discussion. But there's more to it than that. If we really want to understand this a little better, we need to rewind the clock. Rewind the clock, not back to the psalm, but back to the beginning to which the psalm refers. Back to the first king of creation. So here's the next quiz question. Who is the first human king mentioned in the Bible? Think about it for a minute. The answer to that question is Adam. Adam is the first human king. Is he ever called a king? There's no passage that says Adam was a king. I get that. But God did tell him to do something that only kings can do in Genesis 1.28. He told him to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Adam's job was to rule. That was the job of mankind. The first human king. Eve gets to be the first human queen, I guess. We need to appreciate that. Adam, you know... He, God, you know, this, this idea that God never intended to have a king. Well, God's always intended to have a king. Not a king in the sense that he's equal with God, but in the sense that God has his human deputy on earth who does his will and administrates what he wants. Adam was in charge of subduing the world and protecting the sanctuary of Eden. Adam was the first king ruling over creation. The first priest guarding the sanctuary of the Lord in Eden. And the first prophet to hear and teach the oracles of God. He had to teach his wife the commandment of the Lord. Don't eat of the fruit of, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In some ways, that's its own sermon. Just what was Adam's job? So let me ask you another question. Did Adam, was Adam a good king? Well, no, he wasn't. Was Adam a good priest? No. Was Adam a good prophet? No. He fails in all of these tasks. He fails in his God-given assignment. That's what Genesis 3 is about. He, instead of ruling, he obeys the voice of his wife. Instead of protecting Eden, he allows it to be contaminated and defiled by sin. Instead of teaching God's commands, he allows his wife to eat the forbidden fruit, and he eats it himself. Not a very good example, is it? No! 
Adam fails at every task that the Lord assigned to him. He is on every level of failure in his assigned duties. And yet, in Psalm 8, we read about God setting up this son of man, or son of Adam, as his king, and putting all things under his feet. We already know God wants to make his son king from Psalm 2, because God installs his king on the holy hill and says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And when we put Psalm 2 and Psalm 8 together, we see the ideal. The ideal where the Son of God and the Son of Man, one and the same person, are ruling over creation. The Son of God is the Son of Man. And that is where Jesus comes into the picture as the King of creation. In Daniel chapter 7... In verses 13 and 14, one of my favorite prophecies in the Bible, actually. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's the Son of Man, right there. Here's another question. What is the title that Jesus uses more than any other to refer to Himself? Is it Christ? Jesus doesn't say He's the Christ very much. He only says it in a couple places. Is it Son of God? Other people call Him Son of God. God calls Him Son of God. But Jesus Himself doesn't say it very often, except when He's on trial and it gets Him in trouble on purpose. No, Jesus is, excuse me, I should have put that up there. Jesus' most pervasive title for himself in all four Gospels is the Son of Man. He loves calling himself that. There are some standing here who will not taste death until what? Until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I could put more references up. I've got a whole bunch of them written down here, but we don't have time to read them all. He calls himself the Son of Man a lot. And... When you compare it to the rest of the New Testament, Paul never calls him that. Um, John only call, John refers to it when he's getting a vision from Jesus in the book of Revelation. What's going on here? Jesus is the Son of God. But He's also the Son of Man. He's also a descendant of Adam. That's established by the genealogy in Luke chapter 3. He comes to fulfill the same roles that Adam once had, a priest, prophet, and king. But to do it in a way that Adam could not, did not. He comes to truly subdue the creation to his feet. He comes to make himself one with the creation, lower than the angels. He comes to humble himself to the point of death on the cross. And because of death on the cross, God exalted him and crowned him with glory and honor, and he now reigns until all things are subjected to his feet. All things includes death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verses 25 through 28 also alludes to this psalm. It says, He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. But there's something else to this too. Because Jesus was crowned, and because Jesus was raised from the dead, that comes with the fact that others are going to be raised, and others are going to be crowned. The New Testament talks about receiving crowns. Paul speaks of a crown of life that is laid up for him in 2 Timothy 4. Revelation 2.10, Be faithful until death, and I will give you what? A crown of life. We are the kings of creation as well. Not in the present sense, but in a time coming. Of course, there's a sense in which we are a royal priesthood right now. Not just priests, but a royal priesthood, according to 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Revelation refers to us as a kingdom of priests. Revelation 1 verse 6, 5 and verse 10. 
In Revelation 3 and verse 21, in writing to the congregation at Laodicea, he says that he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my, th on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now that's kind of an interesting picture. Jesus overcame and sat down with his father on his throne and now we overcome to sit down with Jesus on his throne. You got kind of a throneception deal going on there with a bunch of people sitting on each other's laps. Well, that's probably a bit too much, but that's what's going on here. Also, and this is a more controversial text, Revelation 20. The famous passage that people go to to talk about the thousand year reign. When is that going on? There's a sense in which it's going on right now. Revelation 20 and verses 4 through 6, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life, there's resurrection, and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. There's crowning. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. Now what's the main point of that? The point of that text isn't, you know, to create some systematic doctrine of this thousand year reign of Jesus that's way off in the future. No! The point of that text is to say that we are reigning with Christ. It's about, it's not about the duration of the reign, it's not about, you know, the, the, the order of the resurrections. There's some issue of that in there. No, it is about the fact that when Jesus reigns, we participate in that reign. That is what Revelation 20 is all about. Now, there's a sense in which that's a present reality. That's going on right now. But there's another sense in which it's a future hope. We're waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. In Revelation 22 and verse 5, it says that the citizens of the new Jerusalem rang forever and ever. Over what? Over the cloud city? Over the new heavens and the new earth. There's that language of Genesis 1 right back again. There's that language of Psalm 8 right back again. The heavens and the earth. They will rang forever and ever. And what a blessing that is. That's what Psalm 8 is really about. When it says you would put all things in subjection under His feet. That's not just a statement of the present reality. It's a hope of what we can become. Kings. The royal priesthood and kingdom with God and Christ. So, sum up. God made Adam to be king over creation. But Adam failed. Since Adam failed, our kingdom has failed as well. We are all descendants of our father Adam, following in his footsteps in the paths of sin and death. But there was one son of Adam who turned out to be the son of God, Jesus Christ, who became king, who became king of kings over all creation with success, not following in the sins of Adam, but rather living perfectly and righteously. And now we have a choice. We can continue following the kingly ways of Adam. We can continue Adam's kingdom. Or, we can become kings by being sons of God. You want to, be son you want to stay in the realm of the sons of men? That's what the world chooses. In fact, the Psalms elsewhere speak uh, derogatively of the sons of men. Sons of men, how long will you put my glory to shame? In Psalm 4, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Sons of men are not portrayed favorably in the Psalms. But sons of God, becoming sons of God is something that is seen as desirable. When we become sons of God, according to Galatians 3, when we have clothed ourselves in Christ, when we have been immersed into Christ, that's what the Gospel is about. The proclamation of the rule of God and the invitation that God will let us rule this kingdom with Him as co-regents. We ought to praise Him for that. Do we love our King enough to follow His will? I hope that this has been encouraging and edifying and has motivated us to 
have greater love for the Lord and greater submission to the King of Kings, who is our Lord and Master, who is our Ruler and our Savior. If you're here tonight and you have not been living a life in submission to the King of Kings, make it right. Let's stand and sing together at this time.